Although Jesus, uh, Jewish leaders wanted to catch Jesus in one of the current theological debates, and so they said of the 613 Mosaic laws, which one's the most important? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds by quoting one of the central affirmations of the Old Testament, the Shema, out of Deuteronomy 6, and we're reading it in Mark chapter 12. Starting verse 29, Jesus says, The most important one, answer Jesus, is this. And here comes the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. It's one of the most important affirmations in the Bible of monotheism that there is only one God. And yet the Shema and Jesus then say it's not just enough to have good theology. It needs to affect how you live. And your primary response to this affirmation of monotheism is that you will love God. The single most important thing that you can do today The single most important thing that you can do every day for the rest of your life is to love God. I rarely disagree with the Westminster Catechism or John Piper, but this is one of the places that I do. Uh, The Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Uh, John has a slight switch. He goes the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. And at this point, I just tend to go with Jesus. (laughs) Chief end of man and women is to love God. That is the greatest commandment. Well, if it's the greatest commandment, if it's the most important thing that we can do, it's really important to have a good working definition of the word love. And I've really struggled to come up with a definition of love that I'm comfortable with. It's, it's a, such a prevalent concept. It's such a, a misused and misunderstood concept in our culture. But it's, it's hard, I think, just to actually come up with a definition of what love is. Uh, I think this is Piper's. It sounds like him anyway, but I'm pretty sure I got it from him. He defines love as, quote, joyfully putting the needs of others ahead of yourselves. The only Piper would put that joyfully word in there, so I'm pretty sure it's his. Joyfully. Love is joyfully putting the needs of others ahead of yourself. Uh, Bruce Walkie, I believe the most preeminent Old Testament theologian alive today, defines love as willing to disadvantage yourself to advantage the other person. Whatever definition you want to use, one of these two or some others, we need to have a working definition of love so we can, we can look at decisions that we make, at lifestyles, how we live, how we spend our time, and say, am I loving God? The problem is that in many people's cases, and I'm going to just as a caveat, that one of the real problems of speaking at a church is that another church says, I don't know you. And you don't know me. And so I, I don't have an agenda here. And, and I, it just, it's hard to know how to say these kinds of things. But I'm not, I'm not meaning to be in your face. But that is a caveat. Let me just say, I think what the human beings tend to do is to rewrite the great commission, uh, the greatest commandment. Greatest commandment is to love God. And so often we change that. And one of the most common ways in which we change it is to say that the greatest commandment is to be right. Now, this is a problem in seminaries where I've taught. This is a problem in the evangelical church, especially the more conservative evangelical church, that there's this phenomenal drive to be right. And somehow we think that if we're right, we're doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, Being a translator, I know this is going to sound strange to you or not, but man, we just get hate mail all the time. I mean, just villain, just horrid hate mail um, because we change someone's favorite verse or something along those lines. And um, I don't normally read the hate mail. Uh, Sometimes I skim them. I kept this one. This was just, this was too good because it's a really good example of someone who thinks that the greatest commandment is to be right. All right, so he goes, he even gave me his name and his URL of his church so I could follow up, which 
I haven't. He goes, Dr. Mounts, I rebuke your condoning of the NLT's corrupted translation of John 2.1. I went and checked John 2.1 just a couple of minutes ago. I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, you are condoning, becoming, and applauding translators who tell what they, in their scholarly opinion, think God meant to say and overrule obscure and abscond, whatever that means, what God did say. Where does that leave inerrancy, infallibility, and verbal plenary inspiration? These are God's words you are changing around, throwing in the trash, and copywriting as what you think God meant to say. Have you no conscience? Yeah. Uh, it's bad enough that you trash his majority text and use the Alexandrian corruption. If you're in class this afternoon, that's what we're talking about. Again, not for any pursuance of truth, but for your precious copyright protections. I don't have any copyrights. But now you openly promote changing what God said because your pious study has figured out what God meant to say. And I did not realize that this was Gomer Pyle because he concludes, shame, shame, shame. <laughs> and then in all capital letters, rebuke. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so what? Um, you gotta have, my skin's not especially thick, but you have to have somewhat thick skin if you're gonna be a translator. You know, this is a person who thinks that the greatest commandment is to be right. There's zero love in that letter. There's a lot of other things that are in that letter too, uh, but there's certainly no love. And, and I think some, that's a real problem, especially in seminaries. But I think the most common way in which we tend to rewrite the greatest commandment is to say the greatest commandment is this, you shall like the Lord your God. We like him. Don't necessarily love him, but we like him. He's okay. The, the tendency, the human tendency, I think, is to love lesser things. Things that are less than God. And, and our tendency is to love money and possessions and wealth and power and, you know, all the things that the world says are important. And then when, that, when we do that, what we're doing is taking God and putting him below those things. And we love these things, and we like God. I am so glad that this church has small groups. And I'm so glad that in your small groups, you talk about the sermon, among other things. And this is, this is what your small group needs to be talking about this week. Honestly, in the, in the, in the, in the privacy of, of, of safe place of people who know you and care for you, do you, you need to talk about this. Do you love God or do you like Him? That's your, that's your topic for this time. Jesus agrees that He is the greatest object of worship. He is the greatest object of love. Uh, a grotesquely egotistical statement for anyone else to make. But for of all the beings in the universe, He is the one for which this is correct. In fact, to, for to love anything other than God, for Jesus to say you should love anything other than God is to love something less. Loving him is the greatest object of love, and so that's the standard that he holds for us. So I think part of this just says when we look at this, the greatest commandment is to love, not like, but love God. How you doing? How am I doing? Do we love him or do we like him? But it's not just, the greatest commandment isn't just to love God, it's to love God. And again, one, I think one of the human tendencies is to love some of the more tangible things about God. We love His blessings, don't we? We love being forgiven. Don't you love being forgiven? Don't you love being justified, not based on what you have done, but what Christ did on the cross so that it's a secure thing? Don't you love having the Holy Spirit who, who is guarding you until the day that you die? Don't you love the guidance and the protection and all the other things that, that God brings? Yeah, I, I really do. You love this church, don't you? You love your staff, I'm sure. I mean, these are all, these are good things. But loving good things is not the same thing as loving God. Loving good things about God, loving His blessings is not the same thing as loving the person of Jesus Christ. 
I had a, when I was pastoring, I had a good friend, and he just, he loved the Bible. He just studied, 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 studied. He liked Revelation, not so much because it was about uh, the end times, but because he felt that it had the greatest picture of the majesty of God that any book in the New Testament had. He just, he just always was reading Revelation, always studying his Bible. And I talked to him once, and I said, you really love the Bible, don't you? Oh, yeah, I just, I just love it. I just love the Bible. And I said, do you love its author? And you know that those are two different things. And I'll never forget his face went ashen. Just all the blood drained from his face. And he had never thought that loving this and loving its author were two different things. He loved the good things of God, but that's not the same thing as loving God. And in fact, there's a lot of good things that can become a block to loving God. That you can, you can love the Bible so much that you never get past it to its author. Loving the tangible things about God is not the same thing. Obviously, they're connected, but they're not the same thing as loving God. But the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God. And then the commandment goes on to love Him with everything that we are. And that's the effect of the four adjectives. They're just kind of piling up. You love Him with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. In other words, you love God with absolutely everything that you are. When I was pastoring, I always wanted to get a giant patchwork quilt and put it behind me because it, I used it as an illustration so many times. I think life is a patchwork quilt. And patchwork quilts right, are made up of all these different squares, right? And in the patchwork quilt of our life, maybe this, this square represents Sunday morning. And then this square is Sunday afternoon. And the problem is they're disconnected. And we have a certain way in which we think and act and speak on Sunday morning that is often disconnected from how we think and act and speak on Sunday afternoon. Or, or perhaps one of the squares is our speech and another square is our thought life. Uh, perhaps one of the squares is how we live in public. The other one is how we live in private. And the point is that these squares get disconnected in our lives. We compartmentalize our lives. And God is welcome into some of these squares. He's not welcome into some of the other squares. See, the, the squares are disconnected. And the whole point of piling up the heart, soul, mind, and strength is to say that every square of the patchwork quilt of our lives is God's. And He is to be welcome in every single aspect of who we are. We are to love him with all of our squares. Henry Nowen says, God is a jealous lover who wants every part of me all the time. Let me throw in a caveat here. I know when you, you, you the tendency is, I think on some people, is that when you hear this, it's, the tendency is to get really discouraged. God, I don't do that. I don't think I can do that. Uh, Jesus doesn't know my life. He doesn't know what I'm going through. I just, I try, and I just don't, I just don't love him the way I should. That's, that's a very natural reaction, isn't it? And what I want to tell you is that that's perfectly okay. Life's a journey. Uh, life is, we're, we're on a journey, and we're learning, and we're growing. And that journey is going to go into heaven. We will continue to have faith, hope, and love forever. We'll always live in a relationship of faith with Jesus. We'll always have hope, a confident expectation of what lies ahead, and we'll always be surrounded by love. And we will learn through all eternity more and more what it is to love God, and we'll never achieve it. Although, what's the fun in that? What's the fun in achieving all your goals? But this is a, life is a journey, then we're in a process of learning these things, especially what it means to love God. And I think God's perfectly happy with that because he made us. That's how he made us. And I think he's perfectly content that as you and I are on a certain trajectory, you know, even if it's three steps forward, two steps back sometimes, we're on this trajectory of learning what it means 
to love God. He's perfectly okay with that. So don't get discouraged. Thankfully, uh, Bob Newhart isn't God. And Bob Newhart's counseling practices are not the same as God's. See if you can think of the skit I'm thinking of. It's the most famous Bob Newhart skit. There yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I can see some of you mouthing it. A woman comes into his counseling practice and says, uh, I'm claustrophobic. Basically, I'm afraid I'm going to be buried in a box. Bob Newhart goes, has anyone ever buried you in a box? And, no, no. But I'm just, it, could, it was terrifying even to think about it. So his solution to the problem is just two words. Stop it! <laughs> just stop it! Have you seen that skit? It is, it is an hilarious 10-minute uh, skit. God doesn't do that. <laughs> he doesn't say, love me! Just love me! Just, just love me! Because he knows that's not how we... He didn't make us that way. So it's okay if it's a struggle, if it's a growth, if you're learning. This, we're on the trajectory, and I think that's, what's, that's what he wants. To love the Lord our God to be growing in that direction. Okay, that was, that's my caveat. Let's look at a couple of these uh, adjectives that Jesus piles onto the end. The first is to love God with all of our heart. In biblical anthropology, the heart is the seat of emotions. It's the seat of desires. And what Jesus is saying is that our love must be emotional. If you don't like that word, I would say our love for God must move our affections. And it's always strange that we instinctively understand that in many other arenas of life. Okay, we're, we are originally from California, so we're Laker fans. And I was flipping through TV the other night, and I came a special on Kobe. And we watched about an hour special on him. And, you know, you don't sit there like this watching Kobe Bryant dunk over seven foot two guys. Or you don't get to go to a Laker game and, and watch the speed at which Magic would run and Kobe would run and go, oh, well, that's, yes, you took off from the free throw line, you sprouted wings, you, you flew 12 feet and you dunked coming down from 11 and a half feet. Yeah, well, that's impressive. Does anybody respond to Kobe Bryant that way? <laughs> God, did you see what he just did? I, I didn't know anybody could fly like that. That's utterly amazing. Oh, did you, Robin, you got to watch this. Let's rewind it. I don't know what to do with my hair, but. <laughs> I mean, we know that when things move us, they move us emotionally. They, they move our affections. And so does our love for God must move our affections. If your children were perfectly obedient and there was no emotional connection with you, would you say that they loved you? Or if your parents did everything exactly the way they were supposed to and there was no emotion, do they love you? See, I just think emotionalist obedience is dysfunctional. It's, that's not what love is. Love is, love includes emotion, moving our affections. The reason I'm emphasizing this, other than Jesus says it, and that's, which is always a good reason to emphasize something, is that I've been in enough environments where people draw an equal sign between love and obedience. Love equals obedience. And love isn't anything more than obedience. Now, there certainly is a relationship, isn't there? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There, there definitely is a relationship between love and obedience. If there is an obedience, there can't be love. That's, that's the way things are set up. But love is the basis. Love is the motivation for how you and I live. But they're not the same thing. This illustration doesn't work great in Southern California, but I'm from the Northwest, so my illustration is if I just shoveled the snow and mowed, would I be a husband or gardener to Robin? Well, I'd be the gardener. Now, having said this about emotions, 
Uh, and moving affections, moving our affections. Uh, let, let me give two clarifications or just two things I'm concerned about. Number one, people show emotions differently, don't we? And Jesus is not requiring us to all show emotions the same way. Now, I am highly emotional. I just, everything moves my emotions. That's just how my DNA went together. Um, other people are not like that. Uh, there's a, a great book, it's written by an Alaskan pastor called Why Men Hate Going to Church. It's a great book. Uh, all pastoral staff should have to read this book. It's on the feminization of the church. And the point is, people don't respond the same way. It's, it, it doesn't mean one response is better than another. We just respond, our emotions function differently. And that's okay. We don't all have to be the same. Okay? So don't think that you have to be that way. But I, and I also, in emphasizing the emotional aspect of love, I don't want to downplay obedience. Because if you have love, you have obedience. So it's not like they're two different things, but I'm just saying they're not the same thing. And we, we instinctively understand that in human relationships. I went through a period of time uh, of real depression, and I just, we gone through an experience. Um, someone like your pastor, Mike, went through. And it was like God wasn't there. I felt nothing. And if he asked me, do I love him? I go, No. Why would I love someone to let me do that? It was, it was that kind of situation. And it took a long time to work out of it. And I remember spending some time with Paul House. Paul House is an Old Testament professor at Beeson. Uh, he's one of the main Old Testament guys on your ESV. That's how I got to know Paul. And I said, Paul, give me a, an Old Testament definition of love. And his definition of, one, definition of love is if you love God, continuing to be faithful. And he said, Bill, you need to not worry so much about the emotional side of things. You need to continue to make the right choices to continue to be faithful. That's what your love is for where you are right now. And that, and that was really helpful and reassuring to me. So love is emotional. It, it, if, if we love God, it will move our affections. It'll move our affections differently from person to person. We perhaps will go through different stages of life where, where things are a little bit different, where you may not feel certain things, but you continue to make the right faithful decisions. But having said all of that, when we are called to love God, it has to move our affections. Otherwise, it's not love. Emotionalist obedience isn't love. Well, that's what love isn't. What does loving God look like? What does it look like to have our love for God move our affections? Uh, in these kinds of situations, I just think it's, it's easiest to look at the best relation, human relationship you have. And I, I don't know what that is. It may be your spouse, it may be your kids, maybe your siblings. But think of the, the best human relationship that you have. In my case, it's, it's, it's Robin who's sitting back there. Um, my affections move me to act relative to my wife. I want to spend time with her. I want to talk with her. We spend at least an hour every morning drinking <laughs> burnt dirt. And loving it, and um, talking, how'd you sleep, what are you doing, what have you been learning, what have you been reading? That's love, because I want to know her. I, I want to spend the time with her. I want to encourage her. I don't always, I fail. I, I want to only speak kind words, I, I don't always. I, I want to listen, I don't always. I am male after all, and I want to fix all their problems. I'm not interested in listening to them. And after 36 years, both Robin and I are on a trajectory. We are learning how to love that other strange person that we married. And we are strange. If you knew us, you go, how on earth did you two ever get married? Well, it was easy. We got engaged to long distance after two months, got married four months later. We didn't know each other. Uh, it was really easy. <laughs> Robin, Robin tells our kids, yeah, if we got, if, well, I'm not going to say that. Uh, 
But anyway, we have a, a strange story. We always thought we needed to come up with a different dating story to tell our kids, uh, but we didn't. Anyway, the point is, my love for Robin and her love for me, it, 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 it moves us. It causes us to act. It, it's full of emotion as well as, as all these other things. That's what loving God's supposed to look like. That's what it can look like. That's what we can grow into. Have you ever read uh, Crazy Love, Francis Chan? It, it's, not many people uh, down here have done it. it. It's a phenomenal book, and I'd really, really encourage you to read it. Uh, in the book, uh, Chan talks about how his father never touched him except to beat him. And as a result, he said, I had no idea what a loving heavenly father was because I had no idea what a loving earthly father was. And he said, to one day, I see, there's the emotion. Okay, that's just, it's just me. I'll just, just get past it. Um, until one day, he said, he realized that God loved him the way he loved his kids. And he has such a passionate love for his children that he goes, that's how God loves me. It's a, it's a really good book worth reading if this is something that you deal with. I think that's what loving God looks like. It's how I love my kids. It's how I love my wife. It's how I love my sister. Um, that is a, an informed passion that moves me to act. Not perfectly, certainly, but it does move me to act. And I think that's what loving God is. An informed passion, an informed love of Him. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. We're supposed to also love the Lord our God with all of our soul. The soul is the immaterial part of who you are. And we are to love God with the things that I can see and the things that I can't see. Now, I'm going to sit here and sniff for the next 10 minutes unless somebody's got a Kleenex. Uh, does someone have a Kleenex? You've probably never had a guest speaker ask for a snot rag, have you? My poor kids had grew up in a church with me doing this. And <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's not especially COVID friendly, is it? <laughs> Give a rip. Thank you. Can you turn this off? <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. All right. My poor kids grew up having to deal with their dad, always crying from the pulpit, and they, they got over it. <laughs> I think you got over it, did you, Tyler? <laughs> all right, where was I? Oh, yes. Loving God with all your heart, loving God with all your soul, the parts that you can see and the parts that you can't see. And a lot of what I said about loving God with your heart applies to loving with your soul. But I want to get to the next one, and that is loving God with all your mind. Uh, the staff here asked me to pick a sermon that would kind of tie in with what we're doing on CBI this weekend. And that's why I chose this passage. Because we are also to love God with all of our mind. Because the fact of the matter is we are not just emotional beings. We are rational beings. And we are called to love God with the rational part, the thinking part of our mind as well. Now, I don't, this is not intended to be harsh. It's just simply asking a question. Are you intellectually lazy? Don't, don't nod yes or no. Are you intellectually lazy? You go, well, that's easy for you to say. You spend all day studying. You're a professor. Eh, okay. It is easy for me, easier for me. But it's a question that everyone needs to ask themselves. Um, are you intellectually lazy? Do you live life as if your mind is not part of who you are? Do you read your Bible? Good. Do you study your Bible? Is your mind trained to love God? Because the strange thing about the brain is that it, it's no good at just sitting. The brain's always moving. And if you do not train your brain to love God, it will learn to love something else. So are you training your mind to love God? You know, study is hard. It, it is hard. And it's much easier at night just to sit down and watch television. 
And yes, there are limits to what we can understand. There are the hidden things of God that we will never understand until we get to heaven. The incarnation, the trinity, and so many of these core issues, we, we just can't process them. But there are things that we can understand. There are ways in which we can grow in our love for God. I don't have to put my brain on the shelf, neither do you. And we can love him with the intellectual capabilities that he has given us. This is what biblical training, my ministry, is all about. We have uh, 132 classes or seminars from the world's leading teachers, uh, 2,100 hours. We have tons of material at all different levels to help you train your mind to love God. That's what CBI at Compass Church is all about, isn't it? You have this amazing pastor who actually preaches the Bible. You have a staff that loves the Lord and preaches the Bible. You have educational experiences all around, not just Thursday night, but in your small groups. You have all these marvelous opportunities to love God with your mind. And in trying to kind of unpack what that means, I want to go to Titus 1. It's kind of a strange passage to go to. But in Titus 1, Paul is laying down the requirements for leaders in the church And what he says about leaders is basically true of all of us, I think. But in Titus 1.9, this is the last of his instructions for leadership in the church. He says, he must, uh, the, the elder, the leader, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. If you start unpacking verse 9 in your own life, you start getting a really good feeling of what it means to love God with all of your mind. How do you love God with all your mind? You know the gospel. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. That's the gospel. It's sound doctrine. Is this not the stories of Jesus, but it's the doctrinal exposition of what all that means. You love God by knowing the gospel. How do you love God with all your mind? In the experiences of your life, you become convinced that it's true. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. How do you hold firmly to the trustworthy message? You put yourself out on a limb. You live your Christianity in all the patchwork squares of your life. And it's when you come into conflict and when you are tested and when people want to know why you believe what you believe, when when bad things happen and you have trouble lining it up with the biblical doctrine that God is all good all the time. It's, It's in those situations of life that you are tested and become convinced. When I was teaching, I taught for 10 years at Azusa Pacific, whatever direction that is. And used to have fun with 17-year-olds. And I got in trouble, and I had to stop doing this. But uh, I would say, you know, why do you, why do, you do you believe the Bible's true? I'll pick on you. Um, why, do you believe the Bible's true? You know, the nice Christian answer, like, like a bobble doll. You know, you know. And, and I'd say, uh, why? I mean, for 10 years, I just met with blank stares. And then this is what got me in trouble. I go, did your mommy say it was true? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe everything your mommy says to you? <laughs> no, I'm 17. I, of course I don't. It's important what she said or important what my dad said, but no, I don't. And my mission at that school was to help kids think through and become convinced that the Bible is true. And until you actually embrace the Bible and you try to live it out and think through the issues for yourself, you'll never be convinced that it's true. That's what happens in the real world. We have to be, how do you love God with all your mind? You become convinced that it's trustworthy. How do you love God with all your mind? You study. See that? Hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Paul was a teacher. The church were learners and in turn became teachers. So you have your seminars, you have CBI, you have all these wonderful experiences where you can be taught and you have a very good teacher who normally is standing up here. He didn't pay me to say that, but I I know it's true. How do you love God with all your mind? You 
do something with it. <laughs> See that? Why, why, why are they learning the trustworthy message? So that he can encourage others by sound doctrine. And when we would get kind of frustrated on pastoral staff, we'd talk about the people in the church that sit silk and sour. Probably not something pastors should be talking about, but yeah, the, the, the church has a contingent, at least mine did, of people who would just sit there and just soak up. Oh, just bring the word, bring the word. They would soak it up and not do anything with it. And what happens when you leave milk out? Sours. And that's what happens to so many people in the church. They sit and they, they soak up Mike's preaching, but they don't ever do anything with it. And they sour. My brother in law is here, so I'll, I'll use him as an illustration. Uh, my, my sister and husband are both named Terry, so we have multiple ways to refer to him. So he's Big Terry. I would never call my sister Big Terry. He's, he's a, that's, that's boy Terry. And we used to have these debates. I don't even know if you remember this, Terry, that uh, early on when I was going to seminary, we used to have this argument that knowledge for knowledge's sake is a good thing. That was my position. I was in seminary. Terry would say, No, no, you got to do something with it, you got to apply it. No, no, it's good to know knowledge just to know. And as so often was the case, uh, he was right and I was wrong. Because knowledge for knowledge's sake puffs up. It creates pride and people sour. You have to do something with what you learn. That's why your small groups are so important. If you're not in a small group, please get in a small group. Because where else are you going to take all the information that is shared with you, both in the preaching and in the, the words of the songs, and where do you process it? You, and we have to process in community for the most part. Where, where do you process Where do you say, well, I don't I think that was right. Oh, that may have been right. It, do I love God or do I like God? What do you think? Do you see me loving God or do you see me liking God? This is all what happens in community. It's what small groups are for. But how do we love God with all our mind? We learn it so we can encourage others. And it is in the doing that we even grow more and more in our understanding of Him. But finally, how do we love God with all our minds? We have to exegete culture. There's all kinds of classes in seminary about exegeting the text, getting the meaning out of the text. But a lot of seminaries now have preaching classes where they exegete culture. Understanding you all are coming from a different mindset than I am. You are from a different culture than I am. Uh, we're different genders. We're different ages. We, we live in different parts of the world. We have different sets of experiences. And part of coming to grips with loving God with our mind is, is knowing who I am and knowing who you are. And in this culture, broadly, uh, the Bible is under attack in ways that it's never been under attack before. That's why I wrote the book. It, it, we are seeing attacks that we never would have dreamt would have happened in 20 years ago. And it's making inroads into the church. It's destroying the confidence that people have in the Bible. And if you're not exposed to it, your children are. And the number of freshmen in college is, who are losing their faith because of this attack is, is, is astronomical. How many are? Because I, I, I see the numbers and I hear the, the conversations. For example, we're supposed to refute people who oppose the gospel. Well, after all, my wife used to make me wear a hat when I did this, but just pretend there's a hat on my head and I'm being a devil's advocate. Okay. Um, well, the gospel writers fundamentally altered who Jesus was. G Jesus didn't claim to be God. Right? That's a silly idea. Jesus was a kind Galilean prophet who taught the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of all people. Uh, and then that, it was that Paul that said he was God. He, Jesus never said he was God. Got a ride to the airport the other day in a, in a ride sharing and, and it was a, a, an Arab that was driving it and I figured he was Muslim from his prayer breed, breeds. And we had this really neat conversation about Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you, you guys in the church have completely destroyed Jesus. Jesus was just a man. He was a nice guy. And Paul and Constantine and all these people changed who Jesus was. How would you answer that? I can't trust the Bible. It is so full of contradictions. You can't believe something is written that badly. Besides, we don't have the right books. We left that Gospel of Thomas, didn't get in the canon. It should be in the canon. It's a great book. 
Bible is the Greek manuscripts. We don't have any of the original Greek manuscripts. And all the ones that we have are copies to copies to copies to copies to copies. They're riddled with errors. They're completely unreliable. It doesn't do any good to talk about the inspiration of Scripture because we don't know what the words of God are because they've all been changed. And, you know, what is it with these translators? Why can't, can't they agree on anything? Uh, th these things are different from each other. How can I trust the ESV and the NIV when they're so different? And boy, those don't read in the Old Testament. God is a moral monster in the Old Testament. He commits genocide. He kills children. They didn't do anything wrong, but he tells Joshua to kill them all. And the way he treats women, it's just, ugh, it's just disgusting. Welcome to freshman year in college. That's what your kids and your grandkids are being taught. Are you able to refute those? Are you able to oppose them? I've been told that this weekend class was recorded. It's there. There's other good resources available. Your pastors know them. But that's part of what loving God with your mind is all about. Knowing what's going on and having studied and learned and having the ability to refute what's going on. If we do anything, you all, if you do anything this afternoon, love. God, just don't like them. Yeah. If you do anything this afternoon, love God, not just his blessings and good things about him. And love him with everything that makes you, you. Your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And if like me, you have trouble doing that from time to time, then get with your small group or get with your spouse or get with your kids and say, what's stopping me? Why is it easy for me to like him, but there's something blocking me from loving him? Sometimes we can't see it for ourselves. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, in all your strength. Let's pray. Easy words to say. Um, maybe difficult words to hear, but really difficult words to put into practice, Father. Thank you that you called us into community. You did not call us into isolation. Uh, thank you that most of us, if not all of us, have some kind of community where we can talk and we can share I thank you for people in my life like Paul House. We all have people like that in our lives, hopefully, that we can ask honest questions, we can have safe places, and where we can learn every day more and more what it means to love you with absolutely everything that we are. May that happen this afternoon and every day henceforth. Amen. Amen.